Welcome to Kegs, Casks, and Cricks and Backs, the ergonomics of beer brewing and distribution. It's a discussion of how the brewer's back aches, why, and how did we get here anyways. This presentation features photos supplied by both Alan Brown and Doug Steele. A special thanks also goes out to the long-suffering Dr. Emily King, PhD, Manager of Research at VHA Home Healthcare and Assistant Professor of Public Health at the University of Toronto. In particular, some of the images provided by both Doug and Alan are duplicates and so may feature a double attribution. The earliest brewers would often consume beer from the same vessel in which it was fermented. This was often the same vessel in which it was brewed. This is still practiced in some rare instances today. We have found examples of clay pots that had a capacity for about 32 liters and depictions showing them being split about eight ways. Before we invented the beer barrel, beer was seldom moved far from where it was consumed. In the ancient period, it was more common to make beer where you drank beer. So breweries were often constructed next to ceremonial sites where beer would be consumed, or small home breweries were built into the home, as we see in some of the Roman villas. The practice of brewing where you drink for pure simplicity and ease of use continues straight through to this day. When it came down to getting your beer to go, the vessels we see employed tend to be a lot smaller than those we'd use today. We see things like stoneware cups, jars, jugs, being able to move beer in relatively serving size containers, we also in the ancient period will see some use of animal hides and as well bark buckets. Jumping ahead to today, we have the standard beer keg. The most common size of beer keg today is the half barrel coming in at 58 liters and the nearest metric equivalent at 50 liters. The sizes of keg were established in the early half of the 20th century. In between the ancient and the modern, we have the beer barrel being introduced during the medieval period in Europe. This allows beer to begin to be transported over much greater distances than before. When comparing it to the clay and mud sealed amphorae that preceded it, the medieval beer barrel was a comparatively watertight and aseptic beer container. The fact that the beer could travel further meant that it did. This meant that the barrel of beer became a standard unit of trade during the medieval period. It is currently defined as 164 litres in the UK and 119 litres in the US. Of course, when we say standard and we say medieval Europe, we have to allow for a fair amount of flexibility. You're going to see variation happening even between coopers within even a single city, not to mention the impacts of recoupering a barrel on the internal volume. Nonetheless, we have a reasonable agreement as to how big a beer barrel should be. You may note that 119 to 164 liters is also a fairly large amount of beer. Depending on local custom, that could be anywhere from 200 to 320 servings. And I think this says a lot about how our beer was going to be consumed once it got to its destination. It may strike many as odd that the standard size of keg chosen in the 20th century is precisely half the size of a historical measurement of beer. After all, prior to that we have beer barrels being the most common, but we also have casks, firkins, half barrels, and pony barrels filling in the gaps between our standard beer barrel and then our beer to go being poured from the barrel into the bucket, carafe, jug, or very large cup if you will. So before the keg, beer to stay came in something big like a cask or barrel, and beer to go was dispensed from that cask or barrel directly into your cup, bucket, jug, whatever. This brings us back to why a half barrel, precisely. Many beer historians agree that the half barrel was thought to be a more convenient size by different industry players, but dominated mostly by big brewers and big beer distributors. And at this time, when we say big beer distributors, we're talking international. This focus on long distance beer distribution really drove a lot of the decisions that impacted the choice of the stainless steel keg. Made now cylindrical rather than barrel shaped, 
the new kegs were easier to stack and wasted, quote unquote, less volume to airspace when packed tightly together. Coupled with this, we're seeing changes in consumption patterns that also feed into these decisions. Beer had to be shipped much further. It was often being shipped in bottles, which was heavy, heavy glass. But we also have the world population growing, and the small number of breweries we have in the 20th century brew more beer to match, which is consumed, again, over an even larger geographic area. We also see an increase in the generalization of distribution technology. We're seeing a higher use of diesel trucks, refrigerated or not, to deliver beer rather than specially built horse-drawn wagons, trains, and even canal boats. This is all tying in with the globalization of the beer industry to have great big huge beer distributors as well as great big huge beer brewers. A globalized beer supply chain is therefore more sensitive to small changes in the package shape, volume, and size than it is to smaller considerations like the impact directly on an individual worker. While not inherently evil, we'll see the impacts of this as we go through this discussion. So why do I think it's a problem? Well, I can tell you from first-hand experience that working in the brewery certainly deteriorated my already problematic back. But further than that, I looked around at my classmates from Brewers College, and a few years on, a distressing number of them had already retired from brewing, not because of the pay, not because they didn't love the work, but because their backs had given out. And that seemed wrong to me. You know, reflecting on the fact that the standard beer containers from the medieval period weighed at least twice as much as they do today, and likely even more than that, it especially seems perplexing that a craft that is centuries old, that we know has always been physical, but we also know had brewers working well into their 40s and 50s during the monastic period, how all of a sudden are we wearing out individuals in their 20s within the space of three years? Of course, when we say brewers are working well into their 40s and 50s, we need to also reflect that breweries of the past tended to be more generational than they are today. We tend to get collections of young people working at startups, or people funding it who tend to be of a certain age, and we don't have the same continuity that used to be present where we have apprentices through masters working in the same facility. So that same brewer who starts at 20 isn't necessarily doing the same work at 40. The old adage that many hands make light work applies here as well. We see more individuals per liter of beer, often owing to the physical requirements of literally every aspect of the brewing process prior to automation. Simply put, you have more people making less beer per person. You still have brewing being a hard craft, but you also see a difference in the competitive nature of the business. Modern breweries compete over the span of, say, a half decade or one to two years, whereas previously, competition between brewers took generations. But all of those factors aside, the big one, in my opinion, is the fact that barrels were made for rolling, whereas with kegs, our approach is to lift them. I've got a barrel wash line depicted here. We're going to get a close-up look in a minute. While the empty barrels are shown stacked, the barrels are shown as being rolled, either on their edge or on the bilge of the barrel, and we don't see many people engaged in the act of lifting them. You'll see in the background there's a man rolling the barrel on its edge hoop. You see rails for rolling the barrels along across the entire floor. In particular, this photo is of a Canadian brewery from the 1930s and 40s. The first thing you might notice is that there's actually 15 people in this photo. So there's actually lots of hands on the job. You'll also see in the background a mechanical assist, probably for lifting aids. You'll also notice that on the barrel wash line here, you'll see both barrels and casks, indicating a variety of package sizes being used. This is a photo of the Guinness Barrel Yard from the early 1900s. 
Not a single person in this very, very busy photo is lifting or using a hand truck to move a barrel. They are all being rolled or transported by mechanical devices or indeed by horse. I'd like to use this close-up to illustrate an important part of early brewery design. You will note that the loading dock for the beer barrels is significantly higher than the bed level of the train. This allows for full beer barrels to be rolled down onto the train and then properly arranged to be stable, and then for empty barrels to be rolled up and off, or if absolutely necessarily, lifted. At no point is it intended for anyone to lift a full barrel of beer. Going way into the back of that photo, we can see that there is one person among those dozens who might be lifting. But in my opinion, he's actually more likely a cooper working at a work table. Regardless of whether the cooper is lifting or not, he is but one of many, many, many individuals working at this facility, further reinforcing just how many more people were working per liter of beer prior to the intense automation of our industry. Let's stay at Guinness in the same period, but shift to their dockyards. In this photo from 1910, you can see absolutely massive beer barrels being rolled down to the ships on rails and then hoisted by cranes. Already in 1910, we can see the impacts of the early steps of automation. There are many fewer individuals working in this photo and a significantly larger number of mechanical cranes. Nonetheless, in the far left-hand part of the frame, we can still see individuals rolling these large beer barrels on rails so that they can then be lifted by the automated crane. But how do we examine barrel handling before the age of photography? In order to do that, we'll need to look at paintings, sketches, and etches. The emphasis on rolling rather than lifting barrels was hardly confined to Europe. I couldn't find a precise date for this painting, but I was able to establish that it was from between World War II and the mid-1970s. Titled Rolling Barrels Out of the Rack House, it depicts a machine designed to roll barrels automatically. When I first got the idea of using paintings and sketches to look at how people used to manipulate barrels, I initially thought that I would find that brewers were physically built differently, possibly because of a childhood of hard labor. Likewise, I thought there might be a special technique or something. I did expect that there would be a lot more casks being lifted than full-size beer barrels. What I found instead was a very, very small number of solo carries of casks or barrels of any type. In fact, these are the only three depictions I could find, of any realism, that showed people actually lifting barrels by themselves. And notably, in the center, man lifting a sake barrel, he's actually a strong man in a competition. I would also point out that in these cases, the cask is being lifted usually so that the load is centered in the body. The vast majority of depictions you see show people rolling barrels instead. And there'll be more of those examples coming up later. But this is a classic example of workers moving oil barrels. This is from 1869.